right, let us now study into the sixth church, which is found in Revelation chapter 3. And let us read from verse 7 to 13. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 13. Responsively, let us read uh, this passage first. Re Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 13. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, but thou hast no strength, and hast kept my word, and hast mounted my hand. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In the name of God, will I make a prayer in the temple to my God, my God. He shall go to the Lord of and arrive to come in the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes to the Lord of my God, and I will write on the Lord and write on the Lord of my God, in the name of the Lord of my God. Verse 13, together. He that hath been here, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, what does this name mean? It comes from two Greek words. Philia, which means love. And Adelphos, uh, which means brother. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia. Are there any Philadelphias in, in, in Australia? Because there's one famous city called Philadelphia in the United States that's in Pennsylvania. And I visited that city because uh, when I was in the States for my, my studies, uh, I attended the Biblical Theological Seminary in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, and which is about 45 minutes from uh, Philadelphia. City of brotherly love. And over there, you, they have the, you know, the Liberty Bell on, on display. A very historic city. And of course, it was uh, founded on Christian principles and value. The city of Philadelphia. But today, the city of Philadelphia is no longer a city of brotherly love. In fact, a whole lot of hatred. When I was there in, um, in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, studying there, it was already a very, very dangerous city. One of the most dangerous cities in the United States. And I was warned by my American classmates, you know, if you were to drive through the city of Philadelphia, and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and it is in the middle of the night when you come across all right, a red light. When you see the red light, what must you do? You stop. They told me, don't stop. Don't stop. Beat the red light. Because they're safer. Because if you stop, uh, there are these very, very wicked, evil people just waiting there. They are waiting there to mug you and to rob you. I didn't quite believe it. Mm, so bad. So I never ventured to Philadelphia at night. Before it's night, we will be back home. But uh, when I returned to Singapore shortly after, I read in the Straits Times, in our newspaper, this very, very horrendous case of a young lady in Philadelphia, she stopped at the traffic light. 
And then these, these gangsters, these bad hats came and robbed her and raped her. She was beaten up, left half dead. They, you know, took her car, uh, drove it away, and then and then she crawled to the nearest house for help. And there she was raped a second time. This is the kind of world we live in. The world is full of of sin, of evil, and wickedness, and hatred. No love whatsoever. And that's why, you know, if that happened about 30 years ago, and things are no better, much worse now. And the world is, is getting more and more like this, more and more wicked, more and more evil. And that's why the Lord must come back to judge. Why doesn't the Lord come back to judge right now? It's only because of his long suffering. He doesn't want people to go to hell. The Lord does not take a delight in the destruction of the wicked, but that the wicked should repent of their ways and live. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And that's why he is still waiting. Although, you know, he should have judged long ago, but he still waits and waits and waits for people to to repent and believe in the gospel. And it is our duty also as Christians now to share the gospel, be a good witness, evangelize to our loved ones, to our classmates, to our colleagues, even to strangers. Tell them of the Lord Jesus and how judgment is coming. If they don't repent, uh, they will be destroyed. They will be judged. But we have good news. And this is what the Lord is trying to tell the church in Philadelphia. Continue to be an evangelistic church. Get involved in missions and evangelism. Not just evangelism in, uh, locally, reaching out to people, but uh, evangelize overseas. Do the work of missions and get the gospel out. And so here, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things, these things, says he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. I know thy works. And then there's a word of commendation. Now this is the other church. There are two churches, right, out of the seven, that have no condemnation, only commendation from the Lord. The first one, which church? Can you remember? Uh, Smyrna, right? Uh, they are... They were a church that went through tribulation, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And they have a faithful bishop in, remember the name? Polycarp. Uh, good. Okay, I, I, I'm very encouraged. I'm wondering actually whether to give you an exam or not tomorrow. <laughs> but I think it's okay. Right. Relax. Uh, because uh, some of you gave the right answers. I trust you have heard and you are remembering the Polycarp. Uh, a church with commendation, no condemnation. This is the second one, Philadelphia. Good church, godly church, commendation. Right? No condemnation over here. You are doing well. Okay. And Philadelphia, unlike all right, Sardis. Sardis was, was very rich with all the gold. But Philadelphia in those days was a very poor city poor city and they were poor because of an earthquake and also the famine that occurred in AD 90 and uh, so they remained that way and then uh, Philadelphia was also known as Little Athens Little Athens Athens you know is the is the uh, is the highlight of Greek language, society, and culture. Right? So Philadelphia is, is called Little Athens because uh, from Philadelphia, well, they did a whole lot. They are known for promoting Greek language and culture. Right? 
in Philadelphia. So, so the Philadelphia was a city that uh, was, in a, in a way, the ambassador for Greek language and culture. So the church is there. The church in Philadelphia. The church in Philadelphia must be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. To promote God's kingdom, to preach the gospel of Christ, and to advance His kingdom through missions and evangelism. And that was what uh, the church in Philadelphia did. God opened doors for them to preach the gospel, to do the work of missions, and they were obedient to this heavenly call to fulfill the Great Commission. And the Great Commission, I think it's good for us to look at it again in Matthew chapter 28. Usually, you know, when people quote the Great Commission, they quote from verse 19 onwards, verse 19 and 20. But, in fact, when you quote the Great Commission, you must begin with verse 18. Because we don't go out with our own power, our own strength, we must go out with God's power and strength, right? By His authority and by His power. Matthew 28. So next time you quote uh, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, don't begin with 19 with the word go. You begin with verse 18 with the words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. When we do the work of evangelism and, and missions, You know, it's not our intelligence, our strength, our resources, our effort that will win people to Christ. Salvation is of the Lord. We are just His mouthpiece, His instruments. Who is the one doing the saving? It's God Himself. His power that can save. Not our persuasiveness, not our cleverness, not our strategies or methods, none of these things. We are just simply uh, mouthpieces of God. And if the gospel goes out in all its simplicity and truthfulness, right, if people are convicted, they are convicted by the Holy Spirit right, and converted by the gospel. So all power is given unto me. So the Lord Jesus says, I am all-powerful and omnipotent go with my power and with my authority i send you out as ambassadors so go in go in therefore and teach all nations all nations so not just australians i thank the lord that you also reach out to others you have uh, you're supporting missions in myanmar right? very good and i pray the lord will open more doors for you to do the work of missions in other countries. I also know that at one point in time, uh, you were very active in the universities, right? University evangelism. And uh, I hope that is continuing. Very good, because there are a lot of students from all over the world coming over to Australia to study. And that's a good place to reach out to them. Right? And you have the freedom to share the gospel. You know, these people from all over the world, other countries coming in to study, and you are, have a presence in the universities right, to, to, to reach them with the gospel of Christ well do so and so that when they believe on the Lord Jesus and then they join the church and get indoctrinated and then when they graduate they return I'm sure they'll do the same and that's how uh, the kingdom of God advances to all nations, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Ghost, and then you teach them some more, indoctrinate them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and hear the Lord promise again, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Great Commission will succeed, must succeed. And when we do the work of missions and evangelism, it will not fail, right? It will succeed. The Lord Jesus will make sure of it. And that's why when we read the Great Commission, we must begin with verse 18. Because, it, you know, you go with the power of the Lord. 
and not only the power of the Lord, you know, you take note that the Great Commission here, the command to go, is sandwiched between two promises. Verse 18, the promise of God's power. And then at the end, uh, it says, Lo, I'm with you always. Uh, always. Always is correct. A L W A Y. Some people say, oh, that's a mistake in the Bible. It's a wrong spelling. It's always, not always. How many of you have always? Without the S. How many of you have always? With the S in your Bible. How many have always? None? Okay, good. Because some Bible has. I am with you always. You know, some printers thought, oh, this is a spelling mistake. They want to add the S. No, this good old English. <coughs> and all the way has the idea of. Uh, 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 all the way has the idea of. All the way. I am with you all the way. All the way even under the end of the world. Right? This is excellent and superior English. All the way, I'm with you all the way. So here is a promise of God's presence. You not only go with God's power, you go with God's presence. I am with you, you're not alone. Right? And that's why when you do the work of missions and evangelism, you will succeed. You will succeed. Because the Lord says, you go in my power, you go with my presence with you, and you cannot fail. So take note of this. And the, and the, the church in Philadelphia did just that. They were not a rich church. Right? They had limited resources. The church in Philadelphia was found in a poor city. They themselves had need because of earthquake and famine. They were relatively poor, yet they were very generous in their heart. With the little that we have, we can do something for the Lord and we want to win others for the Lord Jesus. So they went out. As the Lord opened the door for them, they went out to preach the gospel. Just like the city itself, in a secular sense, as little Athens, advancing Greek culture and language well for them the church we're advancing God's kingdom with the gospel of Christ and with his truth so these things says he that is holy and that is true the Lord Jesus is holy and true he that has the key of David and he that openeth and no man shut it and shut it and no man open it uh, the Lord is the one who must direct right, direct his church and missions and evangelism where should we go? What should we do? Right? And he's the one who opens the door. And when the door is open, and no man can shut it, you go in, you will succeed. The Lord knows there are people there I want to say. You go in, you preach the gospel, people will respond. Church is planted. Right? And of course, God will raise up his servants to continue to teach right, in doctrine, and then the church will be established will grow like a mustard seed, slowly will grow and become a tree, strong enough, and then this church uh, becomes a gospel and mission center once more, a gospel church, a mission church to reach out to others. That's how the kingdom of God progresses. And that's what we must, we must do. Right? So he had the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. And I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. You're not strong, right? You have limited resources. Maybe the church was not also a mega church, a small church, right? With limited resources, members are relatively poor, you have a little strength. But you have kept my word, you're very obedient to me. Right? You obey the Great Commission. And you have not denied my name. You are promoting my name, upholding my name, teaching my name, defending my name. Very good. And you are su successful. But not because you are strong, uh, you are weak. You have a little strength, but I am strong. You, you went with my power and my, with, with my presence, and you are accomplishing much for me.
And so the key here, uh, you know a key opens right, doors. And, and when Jesus was on earth, uh, he already was promoting missions and evangelism to Peter. Uh, you turn to Matthew 16. And here we find Peter's great confession, which the Lord commended him uh, uh, for. All right? and, and here when the Lord Jesus asked the disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's in verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and some Jeremiah, or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Just one of the prophets. You couldn't see that he was Messiah right? and Savior. Then he asked his own personal disciples. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, right? the Messiah, the anointed prophet, priest, and king, foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures that should come and you are here. We, we know that. Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah. But Peter, don't be so proud. Think that you're so clever. I gave you a question and you scored an A. But it's not you, right? It's, it's your Father in heaven. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Right? And I say also unto thee, thou art, that thou art Peter. Peter, you are just a small stone. That's, what, that's the meaning of the name Peter, Petros. You're just a pebble. Right? And, and, and a small stone, you can be kicked around. And later on, Peter will show, will reveal how weak he, he was. Right? Or when he was tempted and tested after Jesus was arrested and he denied the Lord three times. Here a great confession. The next moment he denied the Lord three times. So Peter, you are just Peter. You are a little stone. You can be kicked around. So the church is not built on you. Right? Although yes, good confession. But it's my father who has revealed it to you. So that Peter and upon this rock, and there's a play on words here. Rock is the Greek Petra. Right? Peter is Petros. Rock is Petra. And if you go to a Holy Land pilgrimage, if you visit Jordan, there's the great city of Petra. Red, right? Red rock city of Petra. So a whole city carved out of a mountain or a number of mountains uh, is Petra. So a rock is not just a boulder. Right? A rock can be one whole mountain. Petra. Immovable. Uh, upon this rock, this Petra, this mountain, I will build my church. Peter, you are a pebble, a stone, you can be kicked around. But nobody can move the Petra. And who's the Petra? I'm the Petra. I'm the rock. The Petra. Upon this rock, your confession that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But Peter, because of your good confession, right, I'm going to give you this privilege to open the gospel door. So here in verse 19, And I will give unto thee uh, you alone, Peter. So that's one good thing about the authorized version, the King James Bible. You know, the, the you uh, is uh, distinguished. It, it's you singular, uh, it's the V and thou. Right? You, you alone. It's one person. And it is you, as in all of you, plural, uh, it, is, it is you. Right? The word you is you is used for the plural. But thee and thou is you singular. That's because in the Hebrew and the Greek, 
you have this distinction. You singular, there's one way of writing to indicate it. You plural, there's another way. So the English here is very accurate to the original. And sometimes it makes a difference whether Jesus is speaking to all, right, or to just one individual. So if you use the generic you, you won't tell, you can't tell whether it's you singular or you plural. But with the thee and the thou, right, uh, you can tell. So over here, the Lord says, now, I'm not speaking to the rest, to the twelve, all right? Now, Peter, I'm speaking to you. And I will give unto thee, you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So what, what are these keys? Well, keys are used to open doors. And they are gospel keys. Since you have made this good confession, I'm the, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only Savior of the world, Peter, good, I'll give you the key. You will have the privilege of opening the gospel doors when I establish my church right, at the very beginning. And so the, the, the answer to this question is found in the book of Acts. And if you turn to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, there's also the Great Commission over there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, right? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Jerusalem, Judea, to the Jews, to the Samaritans, Samaria, half Jew, half Gentile, and then after that, to the uttermost part of the earth, to all the Gentiles, right? non-Jews, all Gentiles, so progressively. And you find the book of Acts, uh, it was the Apostle Peter who opened the gospel door uh, to each part, right? the Jews first, then the Sumerians, and then to the Gentiles. Uh, so the first, first door that was opened the Lord used Peter to open that door right, at the very beginning. At, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Right? So in Acts chapter 2, we, we saw this wonderful thing happening. The Lord uh, sent the Spirit and then the disciples were able to speak in tongues, in languages right, to all the Jews that came from all over the Roman Empire to keep the, the feast, the festival of Pentecost. They were all there. And, and so, uh, uh, some of them could not understand Hebrew because they come from other places. So the Lord gave the gift of languages so that the disciples, the apostles, could speak in all these languages to preach the gospel to them. And then when some questioned, uh, who, was the Lord, who was the one the Lord used to be the main and chief spokesman? Uh, Peter, verse 14, Acts 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, uh, you will first what? Uh, speak to them in, from, in Jerusalem and Judea. Right? So the first door. And who was the one using that key to open that door to, the, to those in Jerusalem and Judea? Peter, right here in Acts chapter 2. Right? Peter stood up and lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. And after his wonderful sermon, right, preaching the gospel, proving that Jesus was their Messiah, their Savior who had come, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and we find many believing. Right? And so in verse 37, we read, And now when they heard this, they were pricked, in their heart, and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, 
do all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So the very first church, the Jerusalem church, uh, overnight, by the power of the Spirit, 3,000 members. Who was used to open the gospel door? Uh, Peter. The Lord told Peter in Matthew 16, uh, Unto you I'll give the keys. Right? Unto thee. You open. So here. And then, in Acts chapter 8, uh, the next area is Samaria. And Peter was there right, to open that gospel door. Acts chapter 8. Now here the Lord used Philip, the evangelist, to go down the city of Samaria and preach Christ unto them. And there were those who believed. And after he, these people believed, and he cannot act on his own. He must call the apostles to come down, all right, and baptize them. And baptize them with the Holy Spirit. So in verse 14, Now when the apostles which were, in, which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter, right, Peter and John. And then it says here, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost, right? So, uh, to show that the Samaritans are not uh, kept out of God's kingdom, the gospel is also preached to them, not only to the Jews, but also to the Samaritans. They also can hear the gospel and be saved. And Peter was there at the outset to inaugurate right, missions and evangelism to the Samaritans. And when he came and baptized them, well, they showed that truly the Holy Spirit also indwelt them. Right? And, and they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. There was a visible uh, uh, demonstration of the power of the Spirit or the presence of the Spirit indwelling the Samaritan believers. For we read in the next, very next verse, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power. Right? Because this Simon the sorcerer was not a true believer, and later on we will find Peter rebuking him. But there was a visible sign that the Samaritans also believed. And the Lord used Peter to open that gospel door, to make it clear. So inaugurated. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Peter was there. Peter was there in Jerusalem. Peter now here in Samaria opened the gospel door and then unto the uttermost part of the earth, to the Gentiles. Again, the Lord used Peter to open the door, right, with the gospel key. And that happened in Acts chapter 10. And you remember that story, don't you? Peter was on the housetop, uh, having his quiet time in, in the, at noontime. And then he saw a vision, a sheet with all the unclean animals. And the Lord told him, Peter, kill and eat. He says, no, 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 I have not eaten anything unclean in my life. And the Lord has to, had to do that three times. Kill and eat, kill and eat, kill and eat. I've not eaten anything unclean. Well, how I wish I was there. I would have eaten all of them. Nice. I mean, they only can eat food that is kosher, right? Only lamb, sheep. Cannot eat pork. I like sweet and sour pork. I think maybe one of the dishes there. The sheep, the unclean animals. Sweet and sour pork. Peter, eat! Uh, Chili crab, prawns. The Jews can only eat fish, seafood, fish with uh, scales, right? Fins and scales. Otherwise, they cannot. So all the things we enjoy, they cannot. They don't. They won't. I've not eaten anything unclean. But what I pronounce clean, you don't call unclean. You think the Gentiles are unclean? No, I pronounce them clean. You go and preach the gospel to them. And later on, uh, a messenger came. Cornelius a centurion, Roman centurion, Gentile, wants to hear the gospel. And the Lord has already prepared his heart to believe. And he, of all people, 
right? The Lord says, Peter, you go. Uh, that's the reason, because the Lord already told him in Matthew 16, I'll give you the key. You are supposed to inaugurate missions into the Gentile world. You be the first. And now it's time. So Peter didn't want to go, but the Lord had to convince him three times. So he didn't want to deny the Lord anymore. He must have remembered, I have denied the Lord three times. And now the Lord is saying three times, am I going to disobey him? No, no, no. Although I don't want, I've never stepped into a Gentile home or eaten their food because it's taboo to the Jews, you know, to enter into a Gentile home and eat their food. Now, since the Lord has commanded me, I go. So he went to Cornelius' house. And I'm sure Cornelius must have received him warmly with hospitality. All the sweet and sour pork and chili crab. And all the unclean food was there. But Peter, I don't think unclean. This, uh, what I pronounce clean, don't call unclean. Gentiles also. Eat! And then preach! Preach the gospel to them. And when he preached the gospel to Cornelius and the household, they received the Holy Ghost. And they spoke in tongues to a visible sign that, that they are saved. Right? The Holy Spirit has, has indwelt them convinced Peter, who at that time was not thinking that the Gentiles could be saved. And now the Lord has shown very clearly the Gentiles belong to them, also belong the kingdom of God. I want to save them. Go into all nations, even to the Gentiles. And this is proof. And Peter, you, when you see all these things happening, uh, you must go and report right, to the rest of the apostles. The Lord also has shown mercy to the Gentiles and believed. I am personal eyewitness. And later on, he had to report. right, And he shared his testimony, how he, the Lord showed him in a vision, she the unclean animals, and then this message came. I went and then I preached to Cornelius. He believed and the whole household. And, and, and they spoke in tongues like we did at Pentecost. They also have the Holy Spirit. They are saved. And the Lord used Peter, right, to sort of cut the ribbon, right, open the door, cut the ribbon into Gentile missions and evangelism. Uh, when the Lord says, I open the door, no man can shut it. Whether you like it or not, it will happen. And you should see if the Lord gives you that privilege to enter, you go in, and the Lord will give you good success. So, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts chapter 10. In fulfillment of uh, Matthew 16, to you I'll give the keys, right? To open the door. And you are my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Peter, you are the leader of the apostolic band, right? You get it going. And then I'll give you the key. You open the door to each one. And once it's open, it's open. And then after that, everybody goes in. Till today, right, we are doing that kind of a work. And is God giving good success to missions and evangelism? Yes. So here, the church in Philadelphia uh, did this work. And today, we need to do this work. Right? God is still opening doors. And sometimes the Lord also closes doors. Just like the Apostle Paul, you know, when he was doing this going on his missionary journeys, and he was planning in his mind to go eastward, right? But the Lord shut the door. The Holy Spirit forbade him to go eastward. And Reverend Toh used to joke, you know, a good thing the Holy Spirit prevented Paul from going eastward to do his missions work, because if he went east, he will go all the way to China. And when the gospel ends up in China, they will remain there. Because there's a Chinese saying, all the good water in your fields, uh, don't let it flow to other people's fields. That's the Chinese. Uh, keep it all to yourself, the good things. So the Lord closed the door. Holy Spirit forbade. Then there's a Macedonian call. Macedonia is Greece, right? Europe, West, come over. Help us. Uh, the door was open. And Paul went into Europe, westward, and of course preached the gospel in Macedonia, the churches of Philippi, right, and Thessalonica, Berea, uh, these are the Macedonian churches. Later he went down south to Achaia, southern Greece, Corinth, Sancria, Athens, 
and then later on to Rome. So the gospel went to Europe, and Europe is very generous. And later on, the Lord will use Europe in the time of uh, you know their their adventure in seeking out new lands. So in the time of colonization, uh, so the the Europeans went out, and when they went out to colonize. You know, other countries, he also brought the gospel with them. That's why in Singapore we were a British colony, and that's how Christianity came in. And thank God they set up Christian missions, churches, and also schools in Andrews, and that's where I heard the gospel of Christ and believed. So the Lord used, you see, the Lord directed in this way. They went to China, maybe they will remain there. You won't go out. Those who want to hear the gospel must go into China, and then after that cannot leave. <laughs> but I went to Europe, and the Europeans went up with the gospel. So that's the Lord's way. He will open the door, uh, He in all this wisdom uh, will open the door, and He will close the door. And maybe the closed doors will be open again, but it's up to Him. The Lord directs missions and evangelism. So He told the Philadelphian believers. Alright? Continue in this work. You may have a little strength, but you can do a whole lot for me because you go in my power and with my presence. And you just need, you don't need a lot of money, you don't need a lot of people to do this work. You just need these two things. You need to be faithful and true to my word. Thou hast a little strength and has kept my word. It says, you have kept my word. You are faithful and true and obedient to my word. That's, that's one qualification you need. You must be obedient to my word. You must be faithful and true to my word. You must believe that my word is 100% infallible and error without any mistake. Because if you believe the Bible has mistakes, you have no good news you know, to the world. So you must believe the Bible. Obey it to the last bit and preach it, right? teach it, defend it, or else, what is the good news? No good news if you don't believe the Bible is 100% perfect without any mistake. And then you don't deny my name, it has not denied my name. The name that saves, right? the name that's above every name. If you deny the name of Jesus, you deny Jesus himself. That he's not fully God, fully man. Right? And you have a small Jesus, not the Almighty Jesus, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say Jesus is only what? A mighty God with a small G, not the Almighty God. They have no gospel, they are a cult, no salvation. In this another Jesus that they are preaching, you must preach the Jesus of the Scriptures, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And you don't deny God's name and the name of Jesus, you have the fullness of, of the doctrine of Christ. You go, uh, you have, then you have the power. It's not your strength, not your money, right? That can save people. It's the power of the Lord Jesus and of His word. So you must have these two qualifications. Are you faithful and obedient to my word? Are you confessing me fully, right? At the highest level, uh, you are, then you go and you'll succeed. And then there are those who will go against you. Because when you do the work of missions and evangelism, Satan is not happy because you're advancing God's kingdom. And the kingdom of the devil, and he's the God of this world, uh, his power, his influence will diminish. And Satan doesn't like it, he will oppose. You do the work of missions and evangelism, he will oppose you. And right now, in true life, it's by God's grace, we, we are promoting missions and evangelism. And uh, one bright spot is the Philippines. In the last few years, the Lord really opened door, opened the doors for us in doing the work of missions, planting mission churches, gospel stations in the Philippines. Thank God that uh, my good friend and colleague, Reverend Das Koshi and Gethsemane, uh, they have their own missions in the Philippines. But we also have also started our own uh, the Lord opened the door for us for missions and evangelism also in the Philippines. And then when we went in, we cooperated with them because we were we came later. They were already established. 
and I asked them to help Reverend Rego because we also have a BB church now in Cebu, in, in another part of Cebu, Lapu Lapu City. Right? And Reverend Rego has his Gethsemane Missions Church in, in uh, the city center itself. At that time, we don't have an ordained minister yet. There are believers there. I said, Rego, can you help? Please go there and preach once a month and conduct the Lord's Supper. He was so willing and so ready. So I'm very thankful. And now the church is well established, registered, and, and then we just ordained uh, last December. A, a preacher, he's now an ordained minister, one of our FEBC students, graduates. And then now he's, at least now they have an ordained minister, a pastor there. I'm thankful Rego was there to help right, at first. And then we worked together, helping one another in the work of missions and evangelism. And we have uh, in, in, in Singapore, uh, Reverend Dr. Jose Lagapa. And the Lord used him as the one who to lead and to spearhead because he has a burden for his own people. And the Lord providentially led him to us. He, is, uh, he has two doctorates already. Is a uh, in veterinary uh, science. He, he did it in Central Mindanao University, one of the top universities in the, in the Philippines. And later on, the Lord called him, and he uh, 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 later on he went to further studies in in Japan and got his PhD in, in in vet science. And then the Lord saved him wonderfully, called him in Hokkaido University where he was there. There's a missionary, American missionary there, and and preached the gospel. He believed. And then later the Lord called him to full-time service and then Dr. Robert Klutz, the missionary that you want to go into full-time ministry, you must study God's word. And the only college I can re recommend to you is FEBC, go to Singapore. So he came, studied with us, he got his MDiv, THM, and finally his uh, Doctor of Theology. And, uh, and the Lord used him mightily. And, I, and then he spearheaded this work in his own home country. So now we have churches in in Mindanao, in Bukidnon, and also in Cebu, in Bohol, and just a few months ago, the Lord again opened the door. I mean, without us looking for it, somehow the opportunity came. The people there are saying, come over to help us. Now in Luzon, Northern Philippines. Now the places that we have right now are Cebuano speaking. But up north near Manila, in Luzon, they are Tagalog speaking, now open doors. And people are there crying out for the gospel and for his truth. And, and so we have gospel stations now. Young ones, fledgling ones, coming up in Luzon. And the Lord recently sent a student from there to us. He felt called to the Lord and to his ministry. He's now studying, a new student. So the Lord is preparing the ground, opening the doors. When we open the door, no man can shut. We just go in, obey. And we see fruits, people getting converted, getting saved, right? Getting grounded in the scriptures. Joyful thing. But one thing we also see is Satan working very hard over time to undermine the work, to hinder the work. And the sad thing is the opposition is not from people outside, it's from people within the church. It's a sad thing. That's why I'm... I'm encouraged by the testimony of uh, uh, and the message this morning by your pastor. What is most heartbreaking is when there is opposition and betrayal from within. Shouldn't be, but it happens. But anyway, we take courage. We are encouraged by what the Lord says here. You go with my power and my presence, and I give you the gospel key. You open the door. Once it's open, no man can shut it. You just go, right? And do. And all you need is my word right? and my name. Don't ever deny my word and my name. And then you have all you need uh, to do this work, right? this gospel work. And the Lord says, yes, Satan will work over time to try to hinder Right, to undermine, to destroy. But here the Lord says in verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. 
so the enemy from within to stop or to hinder the work. But the Lord says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. In the end, they will come and kowtow before him. My work will go on, will succeed, even though you know, Satan will be doing all these things. Right? And this to prove that I love you. Right? I love thee and I'm using you. And, and that's what the Lord said in Matthew 16. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are those who claim to be Christian, but then they are doing the work of the devil to oppose the work of God. When, God, when the Lord wants to open a door, they purposely want to shut it. Can they succeed? The Lord says, no. When I open the door, no man can shut it. If I shut the door, no man can open it. So we just follow the, the lead of the Lord. And it will be okay. In verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, and thou hast kept the word of my patience, and the word patience here can also be rendered as enduring. You have kept my enduring word, right? The word, my word of patience, my enduring word, is the doctrine of the verbal and plenary preservation of scriptures right here. Right? My word is not only inspired, but also preserved. It is enduring. It will always be there right, for you to use, trust in. Right? I will preserve my words because thou hast kept, uh, believed and obeyed my enduring word, my inspired and preserved word. The Lord says, I also will keep thee. I will also preserve you. You know, as, as much as this very encouraging, as much as the Lord in His power has preserved His inspired words throughout the ages, that not one jot or one tittle should fail, uh, that is one proof that God can also what preserve us. We who have trusted in the Lord Jesus, once He has saved us, He will save us to the very end. We can never lose our salvation. Once saved, always saved. Not because we are powerful to keep ourselves or we are good. We are very weak. We fall easily. But Jesus never fails. Right? He is infallible. He cannot fail. He cannot fall. And once He promised to save us, He will keep His promise. And he'll save us to the grave. So I will keep you as much as I have preserved my words till today. You, uh, you can be very sure, I will also keep and preserve you until the very end. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. So doing the work of missions and evangelism, you'll be tried and tested. you find opposition, hindrance, right? trouble, just like Paul. In his missionary journeys, he faced a lot of dangers. The cloud of death is always hanging over his head. But yet he pressed on. Right? And the Lord knows how to deliver you from temptation. Paul says, you know, the Lord will not allow us to be tempted above and beyond our ability, but with the temptation, provide for us a way of escape. And somehow, uh, he will open the way for you to escape and deliver you. So I will keep thee. From the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. But I know how to deliver you. Okay? Just trust me. As much as I have preserved my words, I know how to preserve you also, right, to the very end. So behold, I come quickly. I hope I come quickly. Hold fast. Hold that fast. Alright? Hold it so tightly. You know, that, and don't let it go, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Believe and keep on believing. You're faithful now, keep on being faithful. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So make sure you do that. No man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar. A pillar is a sign of strength and stability. 
you know, if you go to these uh, ancient ruins uh, today, these Roman cities that have been built, right, 2,000 years ago, now they're in ruins. All the buildings have all collapsed. What do you see in these uh, archaeological sites? Uh, the pillars. Right? The pillars are the, the ones still standing. Uh, I will make you a pillar. Everything else will collapse. But if you are faithful and true to me, a true believer, you will be strong and stable like this pillar. Everything else will collapse, but you remain standing. I will make a pillar in the temple of, I will make you, right, a, t a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So you will be found right, in the kingdom of God to come in the new Jerusalem, this new city, dwelling in the new heaven and the new earth. In other words, you have eternal life. You are a citizen of my kingdom which will last forever. So he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. I trust we have ears to hear. And we believe this, right? And we hope in God's promise. And He never fails. His promises are yes and amen. And the very fact that today He has preserved Israel, the nation of Israel, after all these years of scattering, right? And the nation of Israel is still kept intact and now back in the promised land. It's one evidence that the God of this Bible, the God of Israel, and our God is the living and true God. He is in control. Today people say, show me a miracle, show me a miracle, I believe. No, there's one miracle. Look at the nation of Israel, study its history. And now that you see Israel back in the land, uh, know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the living and true God. The only living and true God, and is the God we also believe in, the God who sent Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. That's a miracle. Israel is a miracle nation. You know, if Singapore went through what Israel went through, 80, 70 destroyed, for 1,900 years dispersed to all four corners of the earth, and then going through much persecution, World War II and all that, do you think there will still be a Singapore today? No more. We'll, we'll become extinct already. No more Singapore nation or identity or language or terror, English, no, no such thing. But Israel, after all these, still maintain its ethnic, racial, religious identity, right? culture, language, and then the nation, the land that God gave to them. How is it that they still long for the land, remember the land? You know, before 1948, they greet one another. You know, for us Chinese, we always say, uh, you know, have you eaten? Yes. Or English, how are you? <laughs> but the Israelites, the, the Jews, when they greet one another, it's next year Jerusalem. When you say goodbye to one another, shalom. And then next year Jerusalem, they're always thinking of the land. Based on what? God's promise. All these years. And eventually fulfilled, 1948. Another evidence. You want another miracle? This book is a miracle book. After all these years, uh, we still have the Bible intact, 100% inspired and preserved. And if God can preserve Israel, preserve His Word, He can also preserve us. Once He saved us, He will save us to the very end. And we can be sure we'll be in heaven. So that's why we who are Christians, yeah, we are not afraid of death. Death is not a sting. I saw this in my late wife. God gave us special grace. And she knew, of course, we prayed, and she wanted to live. I wanted to live also, to be healed and restored, and serve the Lord together until the very end. But the Lord chose to take her home. And then in the couple of days uh, before the Lord took her, you know, I was sitting there by her and uh, looking at her. And then, the, you know, and then she looked up and looked and saw me. See, and he, 
I think she saw how I was uh, very sad and uh, the trouble. You know. Then she, she, she said to me, don't worry, I'm fine. And that's because she knows where she's going. That's why when the doctors always go to her and tell her, you know, say, oh, this is not good, that's not good, some bad news, she says, oh, it's okay, I have God. I have God in my life. And that's her strength. And she, she knows. And, and that's our strength. We know where we are going. Right? We know where's our home. We know there's a God in heaven. He loves us. And what He has given to us, He will never take back. He will keep it. And once He has saved us, He will save us to the very end. And that's also the, our comfort. That my wife of 30 years, um, my mother, right, 20 over years, she's departing us. We are sad, but yet we are very thankful and hopeful because we know she is with the Lord. So we comfort ourselves with these things. Now that is the beauty of the truth of Christianity, of Christ. Right? And I trust this word will bring that same kind of comfort and confidence to you to live your life here on earth until Jesus returns. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word which is full of comfort for us and also counsel on what we should do for thee as a church in these last days. Help us to be faithful to thee in the work of missions and evangelism. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank mm -hmm. you.